So good evening and welcome to the Hume Crowden Memorial Observatory. I am Jan Kami, Associate Professor of Physics and Astronomy, the coordinator for the Hume Cronin Memorial Observatory, and I will be your MC tonight. We'd like to extend a special welcome to James and Mary Catherine Folona, to Paul Mortfield, the director of the Dunlop Observatory, to John Percy, honorary president of the RASC, and to the Caldrove family. Welcome. So we're going to have um, a few of our honored guests say a few words. After that, it'll be my pleasure to invite you for a reception. Um, and I will also offer private tours of the observatory after unveiling a commemorative plaque. So right now, it is my pleasure and my honor to ask Dr. Bob Sika, the chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy, to step up and say a few words. Thank you, Hal. Well, good evening. Uh, I've been tasked here with giving you a short history of the observatory, uh, which was presented to the university on October 25th in 1940. And so I, I thought to understand that number, we should think a little about where was astronomy at in 1940. It's, it's amazing to think that 1940, the generational discoveries that were still relatively new in astronomy were things like their acceptance that there were galaxies that were outside the Milky Way. The realization that stars were composed mostly of hydrogen. And this was also uh, still right after the period where Edwin Hubble had made measurements that suggested you could measure the age of the universe and it was about 1.8 billion years old. So a lot of these things are the kind of facts that you almost know in grade school now, but th this was cutting edge stuff at the time. So as, the, as this uh, facility was being opened in 1940, uh, radio telescopes were just being built. They were a brand new thing. Giant telescopes were things like uh, the Mount Wilson Observatory, which is 100 inches, or about 2.5 meters, or if you know a lot about our department, about the size of the mirror at the Purple Crow LIDAR, which is 2.5 meters as well. Uh, in Canada, there was the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory had a 72-inch mirror. And this compares to the one upstairs, which is 10 inches, or about 25 centimeters. And the next step, huge telescope at that time, was the 200 inch that was being built at Mount Palmar. So th that was the playing field in that thing. But the one I found the most uh, interesting and, uh, uh, about this and, uh, is that Hans Beth seminal paper that stars produce their light through the process of nuclear fusion was one year old at this time. That was a brand new hot Cutting edge, everybody must have been tweeting about that. It must have been really <laughs> exciting. So a little bit about Hume Blake Cronin, whose picture is over there. He's the lawyer, and he was an MP, in fact, from London. And he had a real passion for science. Uh, he was the chair of the Canadian Government Committee that recommended establishing the National Research Council, which is, a, of course, still a, an important body today. He married Frances Amelia Labatt, who was the second daughter of the brewer John Labatt. And after Mr. Cronin died, she financed uh, this facility, the Hugh Cronin Memorial Observatory. Uh, some other key figures you'll hear about uh, uh, later on today are Harold Kingston, who was the head of Western's Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at the time, and Reverend William G. Colgrove, who was a philosopher an amateur astronomer who apparently had a great gift for outreach. A little bit about the building itself. Um, this floor was offices um, originally, and the basement was a classroom. In the 1960s, the basement classroom was partitioned into offices and a machine shop. And in 1996, the main floor was turned into this classroom or seminar room that we're uh, in today. Which brings us up to today. Uh, the first thing I wanted to point out is today we uh, think that the universe is actually 13.8 billion years old. 
uh, not 1.8 billion years old. But to me, what's more incredible is that the quoted error on that number is plus or minus 21 million years out of 13.8 billion. That is a tremendous measurement uh, when you think about it. And the other number that I want to leave you with is over 5,000 participants per year come through this facility for our astronomy outreach programs and, and get to see this place and everything. And that, that really makes me as chair very happy. And we see a great future for this facility, which I think is a gem in Western's crown. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sika. It's my pleasure to introduce now Dr. Pauline Barnby, who is the Associate Dean of the Faculty of Science. Thank you very much. I bring greetings on behalf of Charmaine Dean, who's the Dean of the Faculty of Science. She was unable to be with us tonight, but sends her respects. She's asked me to talk a little bit about the transitions that the observatory has been through. It's had a number of roles over its history. When it was first built, it was used primarily for outreach and for training. But it actually moved into becoming a research facility. Dr. William Waylau was the first real professional astronomer who made use of, of this facility for research, and he started doing that in about 1958. Research continued for a very long time, in fact, until about 1990. The observatory, as we've already heard, had a machine shop and an electronics shop. And so not only were those used to do the, to facilitate the research that happened here, but also to build instruments used on the telescope at the Elgin Field Observatory, which is just outside of London. And even beyond that, some work was done on instrumentation for telescopes as far away as Hawaii and Chile. In 2005, we stopped using the observatory to build instruments for telescopes, but the electronics shop became a lab for meteor physics, and so its impact in research continued until 2012. And that was the point at which we moved the research and instrumentation from Cronin into slightly more spacious quarters. Since then, the observatory is used for outreach and training. As we've just heard, many thousands of people come through the observatory every year. But another very important facet of it is that we use it for students on campus. So not only for undergraduates and graduates in the astronomy program, but as well, we also use it for non-science students, music students, business students, um, students in any number of different faculties who take astronomy for interest and they all come to the observatory to do a small observing project as part of the course requirements for a general interest astronomy course. So the observatory is used not only for astronomers, not only for members of the public, but also for Western students to provide them with hands-on experience in science and also in space. And we're very proud of that fact and we hope that it continues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barmby. And now it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce President of Western University, Dr. Ami Chakma. Good evening. Uh, let me uh, extend my warm Western welcome. That's how I describe our welcome to all of you for joining us uh, this evening. Bob, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, organizing this event and for having us here. Uh, of the many uses that you have heard, I can add a few more. Uh, this is uh, the room that uh, we use uh, before we gather for our convocation. And in fact, our fall convocation just ended Friday. So I know that I'm a regular uh, user of this room. And <laughs> another use that I can add to that list is that when we have students and their families visiting our campus, we actually occasionally gather them here. So thank you for making other uses of this facility. Well, it's just wonderful uh, to be surrounded by so many special people who have many, many different connections to this uh, great facility of historic significance to Western. And through uh, the generous donation of, of the Cronin family, Mr. Cronin, I mean, what an important historic figure. Uh, sometimes we forget the important contributions people make. The fact that you know he recommended the creation of the National Research Council that's a significant milestone. 
A parallel event uh, that I can think of would be Venevir Bush after Second World War wrote a seminal policy paper for the U.S. government. And in fact, if you look at the history of how U.S. science policy has evolved, so that seminal people, paper actually had made all the difference to the United States as it developed its industrial capacity, research capacity, and whatnot. So today, actually, you know, we need more uh, thoughtful leaders like uh, Mr. Cronin uh, in, in our country because some of the uh, urgent needs that this country needs are not being met because we don't have actually uh, in our political life we don't have individuals who understand what the country needs to do. So I, I digress if I seek your forgiveness for that. Returning to this uh, facility, uh, one of the uh, beauty of our campus is very attractive. And the beauty of people who work here is that uh, they're dedicated uh, to the campus. And these are all cultural things. You know, all of us with the privilege of working here, uh, coming to work actually is a joy. You know, each morning we come to work, we feel good because of the uh, physical environment and also the, the work environment that we, we face. And that is reflected in how we welcome our visitors. And you can see it uh, in many different ways. You know, when visitors come, actually, they feel that they're welcome here. And this is one of many things that we can show our visitors, uh, you know, that kind of uh, brings them to our campus. So, you know, a few examples of that. Uh, occasionally, I receive letters from people who are very happy about what we do. I do receive letters, email on matters that people are not happy about, <laughs> whether it's parking, whether it's you know, admissions, uh, homecoming, uh, the unruly students doing something untoward and whatnot. But I believe, please uh, do know that I do receive lots of wonderful letters. So there is one letter uh, that uh, my office recently received uh, regarding this observatory. I think that speaks volume about the public access that Ian, and Bob and others have been able to provide over the years to this observatory. So this uh, lady writes to us, a graduate of Weston, uh, who lives a bit uh, far away from here, Ajax to be more specific. One day she decided on this spur of the moment to drive with her husband, so the key is spur of the moment, all the way from Ajax to en enjoy one of the observatory's public nights. So we discussed on the public nights. So then she and writes about her experience in the following way, I quote, the young lady who presented to us spoke knowledgeably to a wide audience and brought her topic to life. So that's that you know, special you know, people touch that I was alluding to. So end of quote. And then she concludes that you have a real jewel, so your gem <laughs> in Western's crown, so yeah, we have second independent <laughs> <laughs> confirmation of that. Uh, so you have a real jewel with this program, and I look forward to more evenings in the future. So I wish that we could actually open more of what you do to the general public, because we, we do lots and lots of interesting things on this campus. But I think we should learn from the experience that we have with this uh, public access to this observatory and try to do more. So you can just see that this is just one of uh, many examples of how this observatory acts as a magnet for our community, broader community, beyond London, you know, where we can open up at least little bits of what we do uh, at this campus. Let me also take this opportunity to uh, share uh, you know, some of the wonderful things our colleagues in the Department of Physics and Astronomy do. <coughs> So I'm a chemical engineer in front of uh, professors of physics and astronomy. I claim that I only studied a little bit of physics. But if I'm uh, among others you know, who may not have as much knowledge of physics, I claim that actually I understand quite a bit. <laughs> so with that, with that caveat, so I don't necessarily claim that I understand everything they do. But they do a lot of interesting things that I, as president of Western, can brag about. So one thing that I bragged about and received very successfully by our alumni across the world when I was able to say, with the help of our communications people, 
that when astronauts walk in the moon, not in the outer space, they call Western. So they call actually our colleagues in that department because they want to make sure that there are no meteor showers in, in the region. And this is the place, this is the place where actually we can predict what, you know, when those occurrences will take place. So they just one of many examples. I'll, I'll end with a second example. So just a couple of months ago, I had the pleasure of visiting uh, you know, some of your facilities. And I, I did not know what to expect. So what I saw was you know, our colleagues uh, were developing uh, the latest and most efficient magnet that one can use in MRI machines. Right? So literally, I saw them packaging that one can use in MRI machines that will increase uh, its effectiveness, will increase uh, you know, the cost, uh, sorry, reduce cost, and so on and so forth. So, so many, many other wonderful examples. So let me uh, take this opportunity to thank the family who has made this possible. And I know that there are some relatives of the Cronins who are here with us. What I can tell you is that uh, Without the support of you know, families such as the Cronins, uh, not only at Western, in this country, we simply cannot strive to achieve excellence. So one thing this country has done remarkably well in terms of our success in higher education, we have opened up our post-secondary system to a large number of young women and men. And for that, I think we deserve, as a country, as a nation, an A++. So if you look at just Ontario among G20 countries, our participation rate at post-secondary level, that would include colleges and universities, is the highest. So something to be really proud of and it, it, it puts us in a good stead. So the challenge for us is while we have done an extremely good job in providing access, we have not done a good job in supporting excellence. So these sort of facilities allow us to you know, build that excellence. And the private, uh, sorry, uh, public purse is such that you know, healthcare increasingly is taking up a larger fraction of our uh, public purse's ability to fund. And you know, the projections are really scary. So right now it's less than 50%. And in about 25 years time, unless we can do something about it, uh, the projected figures are about 80%. So imagine 80% of Ontario budget, healthcare related expenditure, you know, highways, roads, everything else, social services, education will be crowded out. So what we do is we rely on support from generous alumni, friends of the university, and the community have been extremely generous. So each year, this university brings in about $65 million of support from all different sources. Some of it is in-kind, most of it actually cash. So it is through that sort of support that we can you know, maintain some of the work that we do. So I, I gratefully acknowledge the support of the Cronin family in a way uh, then uh, that allowed us to establish this and we continue to benefit from such a generous support. So let me take uh, this opportunity again to thank my colleagues uh, who are really the real heroes of uh, this sort of uh, facilities. You know, Ian, thank you very much for your leadership. Thank you for all that you do, Bob, in your department. And we are very grateful for your contribution. So I hope that uh, you enjoy the facility as uh, Ian uh, takes us through and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. The main uh, main story that I wanted to tell you. One of my one of my mentor, former dean of law at Western, long time ago in the 70s, is our governor general, the Right Honorable David Johnston. When I was coming to Western, he was president of Waterloo. He was my boss, so he told me lots of stories about Western. And one was unveiling of a plaque. So when he was a young dean of law, he was uh, trying to unveil a plaque in the faculty of law. So it, you know, event like this, you know, chancellor speaks. President speaks, a distinguished uh, guest uh, speaks, then they will begin to unveil. 
So uh, before I tell you this story, the advice he gave me is before you unveil anything, do a check. <laughs> I think this is good. I think this is good. Now I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what happened. This is a real story. So you know they all lifted this thing. There was a center fold. Oh. <laughs> oh. Possibly the engineering that. department. That's the, 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 the suspicious that engineers did it. Yeah. So I did check it out. So well, what do you want us to do? Go ahead and all right. <laughs> all right. There you go. Beautiful. Be placed. We'll mount it outside. Gentlemen, ladies, can I ask you to just gather around so we can take some pictures? Mm -hmm. <laughs> A little bit of gap, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Chakma. So for the rest of the evening, what's going to happen now is I would like to invite you all to enjoy some of our food and a beverage of your choice. And I will take each of you in smaller groups for a private tour of the observatory. So I will start with our speaking party. Uh, if I can ask you please to stay in this room until we start your own private tour, that would be much appreciated. In the meantime, please feel free to enjoy the food and drinks. Thank you. Are they widely available or are these like a unique specimen? We have all the artifacts that we have in this room are featured on this photograph from 1952. And as you can see, it says Department of Mathematics and Astrology. Oh, yes, yeah. astrology. Again, yes, again. Uh, Actually, the photographs were originally in the main foyer of Chrome, or 12. We have only recovered uh, three so this is quite up to date. The telescope is actually not too bad. We use it for outreach uh, exclusively. I'd like to briefly point out Spirit telescopes has Perkin on. So those uh, that's a corporation that uh, yeah. produced not only the telescope um, but also gave us this black shoot camera. Mm -hmm. Perkin Elmer is the same corporation that the most of us also built the Nerf for the space telescope. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what they cost. And Perkin Elmer was the one that set me up with the Canadian in Quebec. Mm -hmm. He was playing with this technology and we built the first large ones, so instead of buying a telescope this big for the same money we got one. Two and a half meters. We have a lot of here from the Royal Astronomy Society of Canada. They're the amateur astronomers. The passion they have for it is terrific. So we can do anything. Well, thank you, and I know you have one of the more opportunities to come. Appreciate that support. Yes. Yeah. 
suitable in this instance. <laughs> 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 okay, right now, there's no slides. I think it's hard to take this part. This is where, where the chronic surgery is going to be. They use like the same stone as the other It has a particular name. Okay.
years. In this picture, we found back and or on display. So, by all means, feel free to come on in. In addition to having HR Kingston wearing the original HR Kingston's hat, actually, <laughs> right? No lie. We have the original guest book from. October 1940, right there, it's on page one. So you see that Mrs. Hume Cronin signed uh, Jesse D. Dunlap and quite a few other people. There is a new guest book right there, so by all means feel free to sign this guest book so that 75 years from now we still know who was here. Okay? And then in this case here we have two rocks, or at least things that look like two rocks. On the left is the Dresden meteorite, gracefully provided to us by. Henri Bouvier from Geology, and to the right is the cast of the Dresden meteorite. And if you look at them, they look a little bit different on first sight. There's two pieces cut off of this meteorite. There's actually also drill holes at the back. 
Um, so the meteorite fell in 1939, and it was given to the observatory in 1940 at the opening as a gift. Uh, but later on moved to um, geology, and instead we got this cast. Uh, it's like, do they disintegrate or dam get damaged? Just they get damaged, but humidity now because okay. there's so much metal, it gets oxidized. Yeah. Right. So we have to preserve them in a dry so environment. Do they polish them this one has been actually varnished mm. at some point, so it's protected. It has a protein. Um, so please sign the guest book. Yes. But I would like to also continue at the same time and explain what's in the other room. Tubes and the photometer that Bill Weilau used to uh, do research on uh, variable stars. And we also have his award, notice award from the National Research Council when he got the grant. One reason we put it there is it says that it was um, awarded to Dr. Weilau from the Department of Mathematics and Astrology. <laughs> so it's not only my students that don't know the difference. I don't want to get tired of that. So, welcome to the upstairs part of our observatory. So, unfortunately, it's cloudy, otherwise, I would be quite happy to show you the moon. So, this currently purple telescope is the big 10 inch refractor, it's the second largest refractor in Canada. It was built by this corporation here, Curtis Albert, a company from New York. Um, and at the time it was built, they were the largest lenses that were uh, made in North America. Until then, all the lens sport vessels were made in uh, Europe. And uh, they had an experimental, uh, they, they were building, and this was a prototype. They put it on the mount and then decided to uh, ship it because they were in a rush uh, because they were acting up to. Uh, and so there's an image right there of the famous actor Hugh Cronin leaning against this very telescope here. Um, and I should also mention we have a poster there uh, to acknowledge that everything that we do here at the observatory we do in collaboration with the Royal Astronomical Society of North Canada. We could not run any event um, without them. There's also some of our best graduate students here. Only the best ones are allowed to uh, run the programs here. And so we couldn't run any of our programs without There's an electric motor to turn the telescope and have to follow the stars. Uh, so that part is not really Thank <laughs> you. 
Gatorade. So it's hard. So it means it's better for the I work, yeah, just in the I have a story for this light, it's horrible. Ladies and gentlemen! Thank you, thank you. It is my pleasure and my great honor to introduce Dr. H. R. Kingston, who will giving, be giving a presentation with lantern slides. <laughs> Do dreams ever come true? Today we are able to say that at least one dream has even more than come true. For many years, the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at the University of Western Ontario and the members of the London Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada have dreamed a dream and seen a vision. Today that vision is a reality in this beautiful Hume Cronin Memorial Observatory and Telescope, made possible by the generosity of Mrs. Cronin. It will be recalled that Mr. Cronin, as London's representative at Ottawa during the latter part of the Great War, consistently urged upon the federal government the pressing need for a research bureau to address Canadian problems. His untiring efforts led to the creation of the National Research Council of Canada. A little over a year ago, upon learning of the efforts of the university to secure a telescope, Mrs. Cronin decided to erect, as a memorial to Mr. Cronin and his life's work, an observatory equipped with a suitable telescope. In December, the contract for the telescope and the revolving dome was let to the Perkin Elmer Corporation of New York, and the contract for the building to the Putherbo Construction Company. A word of genuine thanks is due to each of these organizations and also to Mr. Omroy Moore, the architects, for their untiring efforts and patience in producing a building both beautiful and substantial. And for the gift which made this entire project possible, we are grateful beyond words to Mrs. Cronin. Perhaps a few remarks about the telescope may be of interest. There are two kinds of telescopes, reflectors with mirrors and refractors with lenses. Ours is a refractor with a lens, in reality a double lens, 10 inches in diameter. This is the largest lens that has ever been made in the Western Hemisphere. The telescope is electrically driven to follow the motion of the sky and is also electrically controlled. Beyond the foyer on the first floor of the building are an office and a library, both of which are turned into instrument rooms for this occasion today. The basement contains a lecture room and a small workshop. On the second floor at the back is an observing deck. With this equipment, we shall be able to conduct some valuable research in certain definite fields, as, for example, in the problem of obtaining the life history of variable stars. <coughs> the principal purpose of this observatory, however, is the teaching of astronomy. Then, too, it will be a great stimulus to the work of the local astronomical society. Further, we wish the observatory to provide a cultural service to all the citizens of London and vicinity, and we shall implement this wish to the utmost. A group, the observatory has already received some further gifts, 
a group of models constructed by Reverend W.G. Colgrove has been given for demonstrating astronomical phenomena. These are the most helpful instruments for this purpose that I have ever seen. A set of striking astronomical transparencies, some of which you will see on the walls of the foyer, have been made from negatives, courtesy of the David Dunlop Observatory. The members of the staff have also made many helpful suggestions in connection with this project. We have C.A. Chant from the observatory here to join you in just a second. A very unusual gift is the Dresden meteorite provided by the directors of the London Life Insurance Company. A mirror and an eyepiece for a reflecting telescope have been given by Mrs. Dr. Thomas Sparks of St. Mary's. And copies of paintings of famous scientific events by the Bausch & Lomb Company of Rochester, New York. To all these persons, we offer our sincere thanks. But I must not weary you further. I know you would much prefer to see the building and telescope for yourselves. It will be open for inspection immediately at the close of these ceremonies and, of course, tomorrow afternoon. May I again express to you, Mrs. Cronin, the most sincere thanks of the University and of the Astronomical Society for this beautiful and valuable gift. I trust that we may so use it that it will bring to our students and to our citizens in general the maximum of pleasure and profit, and to you and your family and friends a very real and abiding satisfaction. Thank you so much for being here today. I would now like to introduce to you uh, Dr. C.A. Chant, who is here from the David Dunlop Observatory in Toronto. He's come all the way down from Toronto today to address a few remarks to you on this occasion. Dr. Chant. Imagine, if you will, I'm 80 years old. <laughs> it is with great pleasure that I bring to you hearty greetings from the University of Toronto, and more particularly from the David Dunlap Observatory. I feel I am justified in adding the congratulations of the members of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Professor Kingston has been very active in the work of the Society and was the president of the entire Society in the years 1930 and 1931. Its members who are distributed across our broad country will rejoice in the wonderful reward of his labors here. And a short time ago, I came upon a pamphlet published by the Dominion government embodying the observations made in Canada of the transit or passage of the planet Venus across the face of the sun on December the 6th, 1882. This astronomical event was considered very important. It was thought that it offered a method of determining more accurately the distance of the Earth from the Sun, which is the astronomer's yardstick for measuring the universe. I was interested to see a list of the instruments used. Woodstock and Quebec each had an 8-inch telescope, Fredericton a 7-inch, Kingston a 6.5, Montreal a 6.25, Toronto and Whitby each a 6-inch, and there were several smaller ones. The telescope at Toronto was installed specifically to observe this phenomena. It was cloudy. <laughs> the majority of these telescopes belong to colleges of various types, and they have been used to some extent in work of teaching, but not in serious and continued efforts at giving instrument instruction in astronomy. Not one of these telescopes is in the same class with a 10-inch instrument at the Hume Cronin Memorial Observatory in power, in mounting, or in convenient housing. Indeed, this is the most effective observatory of instrumentation in the Dominion. Perhaps it marks the beginning of a new era. The observatory is not designed primarily for research, but many important investigations have been made with more modest equipment, and I confidently expect some enthusiasts in this community to make distinguished observations in the future. 
These are serious times with disturbing world happenings every day. We must not lose our mental equilibrium. I contend that the study of astronomy will help us to preserve this. It supplies the mind with mobile subjects for quiet consideration. Astronomy reveals the relative smallness of the individual person, but it also teaches the great fact that we live in a universe of law and order. Long may the Hume Cronin Memorial Observatory carry on its important and beneficent work. Thank you. At this moment, I think we can bring this to the modern day with Peter Jedicke, who is a past president of the National Royal Astronomical, bleh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada to say a few words. Peter. Thank you, Dr. Chant. I'm actually quite proud to be here, thank you. Um, in fact, after Dr. H.R. Kingston was our National Society President in 1930-31, I am the next Londoner who was National Society President, so that gives me particular pleasure. In the uh, notes that we are recreating here this evening, uh, which were published in the Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, uh, it says at the end of the speeches that a number of congla congratulatory telegrams were received. And do you have the others as well? Or are they coming, coming to that? Okay, so uh, we, we thought we'd be nice to try and recreate some of those. So uh, here we have a, a letter. On behalf of the Edmonton Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, it is my honor and pleasure to extend congratulations on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the official opening of the Hume Cronin Observatory. During the past 75 years, the science of astronomy has seen dramatic changes in content and methodology. In contrast, during those same 75 years, the Hume Cronin Observatory has not changed in its commitment to the education of university students and in serving the general public as a reliable source of scientific information and inspiration. That wonderful old refractor and the stone building in which it is housed reflect the solid roles that they play within the university community and within the community at large. They should outlive all who gather for this year's anniversary celebration. Seventy-five years from now, mankind's understanding of the structure of the universe may be dramatically different from what it is today. I anticipate, however, that in 2090, the Hume Cronin Observatory will, in the hands of new staff and dedicated volunteers, still serve the educational and inspirational functions that it does today. I regret not being able to participate in your anniversary celebrations this year, but look forward to visiting the observatory during the RASC's General Assembly in London in 2016. Congratulations to you, to your staff, and to your volunteers in this memorable occasion. Respectfully yours, Dr. Douglas P. Hube, Honorary President of the Edmonton Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And in 1940, the Edmonton Centre's Honorary President at that time was also one of those who'd sent congratulatory remarks. Thank you. All right, this concludes our official presentation portion for this evening. Feel free to wander around in the observatory and look at our displays and posters. And if anybody would still like to get a tour of the observatory, Let's meet at the back and I will do one more tour with anybody who would like to. Thank you for coming.